Safety Mode. Good evening, everybody. My name is Heather Turner. I am the District 53 Social Media Chair, and we are working on our yearly webinar series. And for this evening's presentation, I'm going to introduce Angela, and I should have asked you how to pronounce this first, Lucier? Is that correct? Yep, that's exactly right. Okay. <laughs> And um, we, I'll be giving you a little bit more information about her in a moment. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. We are taping this, and we will have it online on the District 53 website by tomorrow, as well on the District 53 YouTube channel. If you have questions, I would encourage you to ask them to the right. There is a question bar that you can ask the questions in, and we will address the questions at the end of the webinar. So please help me welcome Angela, who is an award-winning speaker, three-time author, two-time TEDx presenter, and public speaking trainer. She is the creator of the Speaking School for Women, where she trains creative entrepreneurial, I can never say that right, entrepreneurial <laughs> women to become paid speakers who inspire audiences. Angela is a member of the National Speakers Association and past president of Pioneer Valley Toastmasters, who used to be in Springfield but is now in East Longmeadow. She has also held the position of Public Relations Officer of District 53. She is a contributor to the Huffington Post, and her work has been featured on ABC, NBC, Forbes, and Entrepreneur.com. The philosophy she lives by and teaches is stop waiting and start creating. So please help me welcome Angela, and please take it away. Thank you, Heather. I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, public speaking is something I never expected to be doing, never mind doing it for, for my business and training other people to do it. So it's very exciting to be here to talk to other Toastmasters about how to become a paid speaker. So before we get started, I want to make sure that we talk about some of the things that really matter about speaking up front. And I thought we should start with this quote because it really sums up what all the best speakers know, which means they're asking themselves, what makes me come alive? What is it that gets me fired up and makes me excited to share with the world? And so the quote is, don't know what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And you've probably seen this quote before in many different contexts, but tonight I want you to think about it in the context of speaking. And you've probably given speeches in your clubs or at work before, and you can tell the difference as a speaker how it feels to deliver a speech that you love versus a speech that you don't really love but that you have to give because your boss told you to or because there's a, you know, there's a speech in the book that you have to do in order to get to the next one. And the audience can tell the difference too. The more excited you are, the more excited they are to learn from you. So let's get past some public speaking myths to start. Number one, you have to be a certain way to be an excellent public speaker. I think we know that's not true. When I started speaking, I thought that I had to be you know, gregarious and move around the stage and practically slide and you know, use my arms a lot and have these big pronounced endings to sentences like I was telling the great American novel. And that's just not true. We all have our own style and I'm an introvert, I'm quiet, I don't really get crazy on stage. I have my own kind of quiet style and I think as long as you're owning your authentic energy and voice, your point comes across and you can captivate an audience in your own way. So if you're shy or if you're an introvert or if you're quiet, you can do it. Um, another myth is that you have to be an expert or a leader in your field. Absolutely not true. You have to know more than your audience. You have to be one step ahead of them. Because if you can answer the questions they have today, then you've done a huge favor for them and they will thank you for that. You don't have to know everything, just more than the people in the seats. Another myth, you have to be an experienced speaker to get paid for it. Also not true. It definitely helps to know how to do it and to have some background and some stage time, but you don't have to have logged 500 hours to then ask for a paycheck to get on stage. It's really something that you can do at any stage of your speaking career. Another myth is you have to be born with the natural ability to speak. And if you're in Toastmasters, you already know that it's a skill you can learn. So we don't have to go too far into that. 
So let's start here. As a speaker, people are buying you. They're buying your stories, your energy, your ideas, your information and advice. And the more genuine you are, the better your talk is. And if you pick things you love to talk about, as, as I already mentioned, your audience will fall in love with those topics as well. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we jump into the presentation so you know that this is kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight in addition to some of the more strategic moves when it comes to becoming a speaker. Before we jump into those tips, I want to tell you a little bit about my speaking journey just so you kind of understand where I'm coming from and how public speaking has played a huge part in my success and in my career. Make sure that you grab a pen and paper. <laughs> I had to pick this picture because I don't know if you have cats, but I have two. One looks just like that. And every time I put a pen or on a table, he feels the need to push it off the table. And this just kind of cracked me up because this cat is really just engaging with the instrument instead of pushing it off the table, and I really appreciated that. So we are going to do a couple activities together over the course of the hour. So if you can grab a pen and a piece of paper, that would be great. This traumatic photo <laughs> was taken on March 30th of 2009, obviously. That was the day that I quit my job as an executive recruiter. I had that job for one year, and when I was hired for the job, my boss told me that I would be running my own business within a business, and I would get to be creative, and I could do whatever I needed to do to reach my goals and connect candidates with companies. And what ended up happening was pretty much the exact opposite. I wasn't allowed to come up with my own marketing plans or really go off script at all. And so over the course of that year, I really struggled to figure out who I was and what I wanted for my career and if I was in the right place. And after about six months, I did a presentation to the owner of the company and my other boss, which contained a whole marketing plan that went outside of the lines of what they wanted me to do. But I, I took a risk and I said, I want to try something different and here's why and here's how much it will cost. And after my big presentation, I said, what do you guys think? And one of my bosses said, Angela, we knew your creativity was going to be an issue when we hired you. And um, so my heart sunk, and I started to feel like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I don't think I fit in here. This is a mess. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. And so I looked back on the six years I had been working at that point and thought about the skills I had acquired and what I really enjoyed doing and what I was good at. And on March 30th, I marched into my boss's office. I said, look, we're different. We don't have the same goals. We don't have the same ambitions. I'm going to leave and start my own business as a career consultant and connect with people who are trying to do their own thing and use their creativity and be supported in using that creati creativity and help them build a career that matches their vision for their life. And he kind of laughed and said, OK, whatever. And I left there. And that day, I started my business with $2,000 in my pocket and absolutely no idea of how I was going to tell people that I was now a business owner and I needed to make money to pay my bills. I decided that day that I was going to use public speaking as my number one marketing vehicle. And I started calling colleges, universities, libraries, and pretty much everybody over the course of the first 20 or 30 phone calls said no. They, one person even said, um, well, maybe, but when how long have you been in business? And I said, uh, since Monday. <laughs> and I just had no credibility. I had no leverage. I was just kind of like shooting at things in the sky, hoping that someone might say yes. Finally, one of the libraries agreed to let me come in and do a workshop on resumes and job hunting. And this was in 2009. You might remember there was a recession going on. And this was a, this, these were skills that people needed. And she said yes to the workshop and the next question was a question that changed my whole life. She said, how many workshops do you want to do? And at that moment, I thought to myself, I think I'm only going to do one, but it sounds like she's expecting me to do more, so I'm going to take advantage of this moment. And I said, eight? 
<laughs> and she goes, yeah, that sounds great. Why don't you do eight during the day for people who are employed or unemployed and then eight at night for people who do have a job? I was like, okay. And I got off the phone. I said, oh, my God, I just booked 16 workshops for my business in the course of one phone call. So that became my a new leverage point and I called another library and I said, hey, uh, one of the neighboring towns is doing a whole workshop series, eight weeks long on job search for people who are looking for a new career and, and need to get back to work. I'm going to be presenting it. Do you want me to bring it to your community? And that person said, sure. So now I had 24 workshops scheduled and then I contacted another place and by the end of that day I scheduled 32 workshops to take place over the next month and a half and I quickly got to work writing press releases for these workshops, going and hanging flyers at, in every place I could think of, building my social media following, inviting people to these workshops. I created a newsletter list out of all the people I could think of in my life, in my past jobs, and sent an, an announcement about the events and asked them to share it with their friends. And the, that workshop series became the basis of my career for the next several years. I turned that eight-week series into a book, um, which I had never really expected to write, but at, at the end of the series, a bunch of people said, hey, can you send us the notes? And since I was still really new to public speaking, and I'd only been in Toastmasters for, I guess it was three years, but it still felt like I had just started yesterday, I hand wrote word for word all of my workshops. I didn't, I didn't read them and deliver them that way, but I did write them all out to begin with, so when I put the notes together I ended up having like 150 pages of notes and I quickly learned that public speaking is not only an amazing way to market yourself but it's also an amazing way to make money because once I started doing all these workshops I started booking myself at rotary clubs and chambers of commerce and unemployment groups and professional networking groups and I kept sending out press releases and I kept telling my networks about it and then my phone started ringing and it was conferences and corporations saying hey we saw your name in the paper presenting a workshop on personal branding can you come give that talk at our place and by the way how much do you charge and I thought whoa I can get paid for this <laughs> it was like this major revelation that it wasn't just for brand building but it was a new income stream and when you're a consultant the best way to stay afloat is to have multiple forms of income and I realized that this could be a whole huge piece of my business and that's exactly what happened. So later that year in 2009 I competed in the District 53 humorous speech contest. If anyone was at the Saratoga uh, conference that year I gave a speech on my skydiving experience. That speech is also on YouTube if you google Angela Lucier humorous speech you can watch that. That was a huge, exciting experience. I also got to speak at TEDx that year. Um, I did a talk called Reinventing Work. And I figured out how to get myself into major media outlets through public speaking and by giving tons of value by offering free advice, my blogs, and recognizing that the way to become seen as an authority on stage is to build your brand up to the point where people just can't ignore you. And that's kind of how I built my whole entire company. My first book, as I mentioned, The Anti-Resume Revolution, that was the book that resulted from that eight-week workshop series. I'm here posing with Seth Godin, who is like the number one business blogger in the world and also the author of 18 New York Times bestsellers and also my role model. I was able to get my book to him when it came out and he ended up recommending it on his blog, which changed my life again. And last year I published two more books, Who's With Us, From Wondering to Knowing If You Should Start a Business in 21 Days, and Do and Make the Handmake for, Handbook for Starting Your Own Business. So those are my books, and I realized when you become a speaker and you want to get paid to speak, you're taken seriously if you have a business and you have experience and know-how, but you're really taken seriously if you're an author. So it really helps to have that credential after your name if you want to get paid as a speaker. It's even better if you're uh, published by a commercial publisher, which I was not. These are self-published, but it's still a meaningful thing to have because it really ups your credibility and just kind of changes your whole brand. So real quickly, why is speaking important? One, you build your brand and your visibility, as I talked about with 
getting out and doing my free workshops. Awesome way to get my name into the newspaper. I got on TV several times. I was on the radio doing interviews. I was contributing to friends' blogs, giving information about my topic and also pitching my, or not pitching, but promoting my speaking gigs. It helps you to be seen as a leader and build your credibility and simply because you're on stage and people who talk on stage are seen as authority figures. You can build your income, as I found out, surprisingly and amazingly. <laughs> and I call it networking on steroids. Because I've gone to many networking events where there are maybe 100, 150 people in the room. And you walk in and think, OK, I have an hour and a half. I'm going to try to talk to at least 10 people tonight and have some productive conversations which is nice to talk to 10 people out of 150, but what if you could walk into that room and give a 30 or 40 minute presentation in front of all 150 people? Now you've just basically networked with every single person in the room because now they know your personality, they know your expertise, they know your value, and they can recommend you for future speaking gigs because every speaking gig is an audition for your next speaking gig and it's a, Speaking at networking events is an amazing way to meet everybody in the room, and as far as I know, there is no other way to do that. It's also uh, it's a great method of personal growth. I call it a master's degree in your own psyche. I've learned more about myself through public speaking than any other endeavor, any weekend retreat, any you know self-help book, even running a business. I've learned more from public speaking than I have in anything else I've ever done. And I feel that it helps you to tap into your strength. You get to learn about yourself under pressure and when you're in a fear, fearful and challenging situation. And you get to surprise yourself when you get on stage and you're able to answer everybody's questions. And you're, you're more comfortable than you expected. And you inspire people and you learn, wow, I have something of value to say. I'm doing important work. And that changes you. It helps you to build confidence. You can inspire people, which is a huge, huge reason to speak. You get to share your story, and it totally sets you apart because there are not very many people who are willing to speak. So let's jump into tip number, number one, and I hope you have your pen and paper handy. I hope your cat has not already taken that from you and you know, hit it under a heater or a couch in your house. <laughs> I think I have 50 pens. Um, under couches in my house. So tip number one, pick one topic. If you're trying to become a paid speaker, you need to be known for something. Not known for everything, but known for one thing. And a great way to do this is by building a mind map. So I want you to think about your central topic you want to be known for. In this example, this person is a health coach. She wants to be known for health. Makes sense, right? So what are some of the topics that she could give speeches on that would fall under that umbrella? So she has sleep, diet, exercise, stress. These are excellent topics that all orbit her main topic of health. So what I want you to do now is grab your paper and draw a circle in the middle and write in your core topic that you want to be known for. What is it that's important to you? What, if you have a business, what's the core offering that you serve? And take about 30 seconds to just write a couple of branches off of your core subject. All right, and you can fill in the rest later because I'm sure there'll be a ton more branches, but it's good to just get this started because we're going to use this for the next step. Tip number two, create a speaking plan. I have to say one of the biggest mistakes I made when I started my business was not creating a speaking plan. In my mind, I thought all exposure is good exposure. Every time I get out of my house and meet people, I'm building my business. And it didn't really occur to me that I could have built a more strategic path 
to building my business through speaking because that would have really served me much more. And in a minute, I'll tell you about some of the other mistakes I made in this speaking plan. But what I want you to think about first is where do you want to go and who do you want to be seen by? And what type of speaker do you want to be? There are several different kinds. There's a platform speaker, which means you're someone who gives free talks and you give lots of information and great content and great value and at the end you sell your audience something. Maybe you're selling them a course you created, maybe it's a weekend retreat or your book or a workbook or some kind of product or service. So platform speaking is all about inviting everyone in for a free conversation and then you get paid at the end when they buy the things that you're selling. The second type of speaker is the keynote speaker which typically happens at conferences and you'll speak during a breakfast or lunch or dinner. You'll talk for maybe an hour and keynote speakers are usually, usually motivational speakers. It's not really an interactive conversation. It's more of just a straight talk. The third type of speaker is a trainer or a workshop presenter. These are the more interactive presentations. You might have people at round tables. You might have workbooks, worksheets. You have less of you talking and more of maybe people working, talking to each other, having a discussion with the group, and things are happening during that presentation. And people are leaving the room with aha moments, new information they can get started on right away. They might have created a plan to try something new during your workshop. A facilitator is someone who makes a meeting work. You keep time, you take notes, you make sure everyone knows where they need to be and what they need to be talking about. You keep everybody on schedule. You, you're kind of just making sure everything runs smoothly. And then you can also be a hybrid. You don't have to just pick one. You could be a keynote speaker and a trainer. But it's good to figure that out up front so when you, have, you create your speaker page on your website, you're indicating to event planners and clients, potential clients, what kind of speaker you are and what they can anticipate from you. So the second thing we're going to do is create a mini speaker plan. And I want you to think about who your target audience is for your business. Let's say for the person I talked about earlier who had the health mind map, her target audience is small business owners who are struggling to stay healthy while also growing their business. And then ask yourself, what does my audience need? For her, she would say, well, they need diet and exercise advice, support, and useful tips to get healthy. So I want you to take 30 seconds right now to write down your target audience and what they need. Okay, hopefully you jotted something down for those two questions. And now you're going to ask yourself, what problems are you solving for them? And you can think about these in terms of like saving money, getting an amazing product, saving time, learning a new skill, having an amazing experience, building memories, feeling better or looking better. What's the outcome you're providing for your audience? And this isn't just, well, they're going to learn something. Like, what are they learning? <laughs> How are you enriching their life in some way? And this is really important for you because people invest in things that help their life in some way. If it makes them feel good, if it makes them save time, if it helps them to you know, learn a new skill, these are all reasons that people will show up at your workshop. So you need to determine up front who are you helping, what are you helping them do, and how are you solving their problem? And where will you find them? Where do these people get information right now? Looking at the health coach example, she might think about like the 
the grocery store. Maybe there's a nutritionist at the grocery store they go to. Maybe they go to a, a dietitian. Maybe they talk to their doctor. Maybe they go online and look at WebMD. So thinking about all the places they're already going to get this information is a good starting point because you can then go and pitch yourself as a speaker in those places. Perhaps there's, I know, I think Whole Foods in my area does a series of workshops at Whole Foods on different subjects pertaining to diet and nutrition, gardening and health. And they have speakers come in from the community all the time. That would be a great place to target if you're a health coach. And ask yourself, where does my audience go for information and also what groups do they belong to? Are there complementary industries I could be looking at that maybe my customers hang out, at, hang out in, like yoga classes, Pilates, at different gyms, maybe they're at the, the track. What do people who have these interests in health and fitness and diet do besides just looking at the health, you know, the, what they're eating? What, what's the rest of their lifestyle like? Are there opportunities for partnerships? Are there community organizations that cater to this audience? Are there professional associations? These are important questions to ask yourself because they'll help you to start building a targeted speaker plan so you're not just speaking everywhere and anywhere, but you're actually looking at the places that will help you to build your credibility and build your brand and eventually get you into those paid speaking gigs. So I want you to think of some possible talks for your mini speaker plan. Go back to your mind map and pick two topics that you feel are most exciting that you would love to present. And ask yourself, what will learning about this topic mean to them? How will it help them? In other words, what's the problem I'm solving for them from this topic? And there's a formula to create your title. Your title. You want to create a catchy hook and a takeaway. So let's say you picked sleep. You're the health coach. Your example the small business owners, and your example talk could be unleash the blankies, eight ways to get more sleep while growing your small business. And for anyone who has started a business, you probably know you don't sleep very much in the first year. There's probably a good chance that you are sleep, were sleep deprived, you weren't doing great work, you could use some guidance and some accountability, and attending a workshop like this for an hour could have maybe saved you some, I don't know, some bad work you put out there because you weren't getting sleep. So this, this example talk is a good example of a catchy hook and a takeaway in the title. Here are a couple more. Let's say she picks stress as her example topic. The audience, mompreneurs, mothers who are business owners. The example title. Put the donut down, stop surviving, and start thriving during times of stressful business growth. Great topic. And any mompreneurs who feel like they can't get through the day because they're trying to do too many things, this will resonate with them. Another topic, diet and nutrition. Example audience, new small business owners. Example title, extreme health is possible. Five easy steps for new business owners to take today. And we always see this portrait of business owners, like they're surviving on coffee and ramen noodles, they're dragging around trying with their computers just trying to keep up. And that doesn't have to be the archetype for new business owners. And so this health coach wants to change the lifestyle for new business owners so that they can put out a better product. So this is what your mini speaker plan looks like. You've outlined your customer, you've outlined their problem or their need, your solution, you've determined where you'll find them, and you're going to figure out your title. This is awesome. In just five minutes, you've already created a whole plan for yourself that you could execute over the next year as you become a paid speaker. And the more effort you put into clearly identifying your core offering, your target customer, and where you're going to find them, the faster you'll get to paid speaking gigs because you'll be putting all your energy into the exact thing that you want to be known for instead of running around with five different topics and 10 different audiences and 15 different paths. The more you can focus your energy, the faster you'll move. Tip number three, know when to say no. You remember a couple minutes ago I said there was another big mistake I made when I started my business? This was it. 
<laughs> I don't know if you're someone who is a people pleaser, if you have a hard time saying no to people, if you tend to want to do everything because you see everything in life as an opportunity and an opportunity to grow, like I do, then saying no is probably your least favorite thing to do. But what ended up happening to me was I somehow got on the middle school speaking circuit. I went into one middle school to talk about my entrepreneurial journey, and before I knew it, I, I was speaking at middle schools every week. There was a woman who worked at the first middle school who was the like kind of like a career coach, but she was doing middle school students, so she was kind of like hooking up the students with parents and community members who would come into the school and, and talk to them. And she did this for several schools. It was a whole network. So after I went to the first one, she said, oh, would you come speak at this other school? I also helped them out. And I was like, sure. And then that kept happening. And before I knew it, I was just constantly at middle schools. <laughs> and I didn't know how to say no because I felt like I'm doing this great service and these kids really need to hear this. And oh, how can I say no? They're, they're so great. But it was taking up a lot of my time. And so what I had to do was ask myself when I started getting more savvy and recognizing I needed to get my time back was, is this part of my speaking plan? This is a question I had to ask myself constantly. And I had to even write this up on a piece of paper and hang it over my computer so that when someone called or emailed and said, hey, we'd love to have you come speak at the, you know, this ice cream shop, I have to ask myself, is this part of my speaking plan? No. So now I need to find a way to say no to this because I can only be so generous because there's a word in speaking business that, that means making money. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you to determine which one that is. So what I had to do so that I actually set boundaries that I could actually hold myself to was set a certain number of hours aside each month for volunteer speaking events. And once the, that number of hours is filled, it's filled and you have to be strict with yourself so you don't go over your time limit. When I set this little rule up for myself, I think I said five hours a month, which was like a quarter of what I was doing. So once I filled up the five hours, it was easy for me to say no because I didn't have any more time available in the month. The rest was all towards building my speaking business and my consulting business. So being really clear with yourself about what you can do and can't do is going to set you up for success because you're going to put more time into the thing that matters most and that is your speaking plan. Tip number four, leverage free. This is very important. There are so many reasons to do free gigs and you really shouldn't be turning them down you know, as long as they're aligned with your speaking plan because they're the stepping stones to getting bigger gigs. They're also all of these things. Networking on steroids, as we talked about. You can get newsletter signups. When you get people to sign up for your newsletter who have seen you speak, they're now fans of you because they actually sat with you for an hour, an hour and a half. They got to watch you. They got to learn from you. They engaged with you. You probably moved them in some way. You inspired them. And now they're excited to hear from you. And I have to say, there are people who have signed up for my newsletter like back in 2010 and just in the last couple of months bought something from me for the first time. <laughs> and I had to laugh because I thought when I saw their name, I said, didn't we meet back at that library like six or seven years ago? And they said, yeah, I've been following you ever since, but I just didn't have a reason to buy something from you until now. I'm like, wow, wow. So newsletter signups are an awesome reason to do free gigs because if you have 10 people in the room or 100 people in the room, you have a brand new group of fans who want to stay connected to you. So make sure you always have a clipboard with a little sign-up sheet that just asks for a name and email address and pass it around the room. Make a mention of it during your talk and tell people why they're signing up. Tell them what they can get from you as a result of being on your list. Also, you can offer a special giveaways, offers to everyone in the room. Maybe you created a new report or a worksheet or you have a, a short ebook. You can give that away to everybody. And these special offers are a great way to bring people into your business and build new connections and new fans. 
You also get to show your value before asking for money, which is always a really great way to introduce people to what you do in a very like low threat, you know, kind of an environment where you're not asking for anything, you're just letting them know what's there, and then if they like it, they can engage with you. You also get to network with organizers and build relationships, which is so much more valuable than emailing your speaker one sheet or filling out a proposal during a call for speakers. At that point, you're just a name in a pile. But if you can actually present in front of an organizer and they see energy and they see your style and they like it, well, now they have a much more compelling reason to hire you in the future. And like I said earlier, every speaking gig is an audition for your next speaking gig. So the more times you're on stage in front of your target audience, the more opportunities you're creating for yourself. You're also building your credibility and your brand. You're creating visibility and exposure. All of this stuff is priceless. And you're building a memorable experience. It's been really interesting now that I've had you know, seven or eight years out there speaking, I'll be at the grocery store you know, on a Saturday morning, not even going out of my way to try and dress up <laughs> and have people come up to me and say, Hey, aren't you Angela Lucy? I thought I, I saw you speak like five years ago at this conference in Boston, and I just want to let you know you changed my life. <laughs> it's really funny how often that happens, and you don't even realize it because those people leave the room and you might not ever see them again. But there's probably going to be hundreds, thousands of people out there in the world who had their life changed because of something you said on stage that day. So that's a really great reason to do a free speaking gig. And you never know how it comes back to you. Free speaking gigs are also the path to big conferences. So one thing I always recommend to my students is to speak at local chapters first. Because sometimes there's a national conference going on where they're going to hire a keynote speaker maybe for five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars and that's exciting and that's a great next step at some point but you can't really start there if you don't have the credibility in the name yet. So instead start at a local chapter and give a speech at their conference or at their monthly meeting and once you've built a relationship with the president or the organizer of the meeting ask them for a testimonial and an introduction to the person who plans the regional conference. And then you can talk to them about potentially doing the keynote at the regional conference or you know, doing a workshop there. And now you've got a relationship with those people and you can get another testimonial. And then if you're armed with those two things, now you've got relationships with people that are connected to the national conference and probably have relationships with them in some way, so their name carries more credibility, and you've got the testimonials. So that's much more valuable than just going straight to the national conference without that credibility. You can also attend big conferences and make it a goal to meet the organizers, and then try and follow up with them afterwards to have a coffee and talk to them about the event. And since you're a speaker, you go to a lot of conferences and you might have some good feedback for them to improve their event in the future. And when you can give feedback that makes their work more valuable, now you become an asset to them. And you're more than just a, a wannabe speaker or a person who's trying to get scheduled for the upcoming year. You're someone who's an advisor, a partner, someone who they look to for advice, that you're in their network now. So looking for ways to become more valuable is a good way to build that to potentially speak at the big conference. You can also find smaller, similar conferences and note what the keynote speakers are talking about and start making lists of the hot topics in your industry and look at what the bigger speakers are talking about too. If you see that the topic of the keynote at the Google conference this year is innovation in the workplace, you should be thinking about weaving that into your talks. Because <laughs> if, they, if they're paying someone probably $50,000 to give a talk on that subject, there's a good chance that that's on the minds of all the people in the audience and the bigger companies. So be paying attention to the hot topics and the trends so that you can make sure that you're kind of going in that direction as well. Tip number five, know your value. Very important. The way to know your value is to be educated on what you're trying to sell. 
and to also understand what the value is to you of the speaking gig. So what is the full list of benefits? What are you gaining that is not monetary? This is really important to know because it's not all going to be about the paycheck. Like I said, you might be able to build a relationship with someone. You might be able to be affiliated with an organization that boosts your credibility overnight. Or maybe you can sell your books at that event and you'll make much more money just by doing that in the back of the room. Also, is this aligned with your speaker plan? What is it worth to you? Great question to ask yourself when you're setting up a gig. Is this a middle school? <laughs> you know, like looking at each component and whether or not it matches with your end goal is what's going to help you to be the most successful. Asking yourself, will this advance my goal? Does this put enough money in my pocket? And what's my bottom line? Because oftentimes you can negotiate with meeting planners and if they throw out a number and you don't like it, you can ask for more. But you should know before you get on the phone or have your meeting with them, what's the bottom line you'll accept in terms of money? And are there other things you can negotiate? Let's say you wanted no less than $500 for your speaking gig and they offered $400. Well, how could you two meet in the middle? Does it mean you speak for less time? Does it mean that you're able to sell your books in the back of the room in addition to the speaking fee? Does it mean that the conference will buy 100 of your books from you too? Make sure that you're not giving everything away and you know your value, you know your bottom line, and that you have the confidence to negotiate for what you're worth and that you get a good deal out of it too. But that means knowing everything that's at play not just the dollar amount, but also how else you're going to benefit by being there and being listed as a speaker alongside all the other speakers and, and how that's going to help you for your next step. Yes, uh, pricing is an art and a science. This is for sure. So you have to know what the opportunity is worth to you. You have to know what the opportunity is worth to them. This is very important. And this is why it's so important to pick a topic, one topic, and become known for it. Like making sure that your topic and, and the things that you share in your speech is your own system, your own steps, your own proprietary process. If you have IP, intellectual property, in your speech, it's even more valuable because you're the only person who can deliver it. So that gives you more leverage as well, and that makes you more valuable. So understand the common fees paid in different fields. This is important. I one time was talking to a corporation very, very early on, and they asked me for my rate for a one-hour workshop for their young professionals. And I said, well, I charge $125 an hour, and it'll take me about half an hour to get there and an hour to make the worksheet. So I guess three hours, so like $375. And they just looked at me like, huh, what? <laughs> they were definitely realizing in that moment that I was not a professional speaker, and that I was brand new at this. And they took advantage of that and said, OK, sure, yeah, we'll go with $375. And I realized years later that I should have asked for $3,000. But I had no idea what I was doing because I didn't know the common fees paid in different fields at that time. This is one of the things I teach in my speaking school because it's really important to show up to those conversations armed with the knowledge of the expectations and around the range that they're willing to work in. And without that, it does kind of come across like you're an amateur. And I had way too many moments and made way too many mistakes early on where I threw out numbers that were just crazy, like either way too low or way too high. And definitely lost some confidence in, in my client in recognizing whether or not I could do the job. So this is an important thing to think about, but it is an art and a science, so there's a lot of room to play. And one of the best questions you can ask a client is, what's your budget? And if you're not used to asking that question, I would recommend writing it down somewhere, maybe on a post-it and putting it on your steering wheel or on your bathroom mirror. And just saying it out loud every day. You could say it to your spouse or your dog or your mailman. What's your budget? Just to get used to saying it out loud so that when you're in a conversation with a potential client or event planner, you can say, what's your budget? With confidence and 
you know, in a friendly tone without sounding totally weird and scared because that sets the tone for that conversation. So getting used to saying what's your budget is important. Here's a bonus tip, and I got into this a bit a second ago, but create your own system or product. You may have heard of Jack Canfield. He was a motivational speaker who would go into corporations and speak at, do, you know, do big keynote speeches at conferences, and he realized that he was sharing a lot of inspiring stories about other people. And one day he decided to compile all of those stories into one book and called it Chicken Soup for the Soul. And he shopped that book around to 50 or 60 publishers and got rejected by all of them. They all said, this is never going to work. Nobody cares. This doesn't have any sizzle. We don't want to do this. Finally, one publisher took a chance on him and gave him a small run and kind of said, all right, we'll, we'll see how this goes. And he was the person who bought the most of his books, took them to his speaking gigs, and sold them in the back of the room. And he would sell four or 500 copies in one day at one speaking event. And then he came out with another one and another one. And I'm sure you're familiar with the series. He sold over 500 million books. There are more than 200 books in the series. There's the Teenage Soul, the Mother's Soul. I'm sure you have one in your collection. And they've branched out to puzzles. They sell pasta sauce <laughs> and health and beauty products. They're, they're going all out. And Jack Canfield did this because he realized that in his speeches, there was an opportunity to repurpose what he was selling in an interesting way. And he gave it his own title. I mean, essentially, Chicken Soup for the Soul is a book of, it's a collection of stories about people's lives. That's not a new idea. But he took it and made it his own and built his own brand around a very simple concept and has sold over 500 million of them. And you can do that too. It's a matter of creating a brand for yourself that sets you apart from others and then going out and talking about it. And this is a great way to create value for your business and become more in demand because you're the only person who can talk about it. So we've gone over all the reasons why you should be doing this. Final word. If you're wondering how to become a better speaker, and if you're in Toastmasters, you probably already know this, and you've probably already heard this from Darren LaCroix, the world champion of public speaking, and also a great person to follow for public speaking advice. If you ever ask him, Darren, how do I become a better speaker? He'll always say this, stage time, stage time, stage time. And I could not agree more. If you're trying to become a paid speaker, keep getting on stage, work your speaker plan, become known for one thing, build a system that's your own, and you will fly. If you want more information about how to become a professional speaker, definitely get on my mailing list. I send out a newsletter every week with public speaking tips. I talk about up my upcoming courses and events. Sometimes I do free public speaking events. I just ran the Speaking School for Women this spring, and I'll be running it again online in the fall. And I also give out little free goodies. So um, make sure you get on my mailing list. And if you want to follow me on social media, my handles are there. So we can now open it up to questions. If anyone has a question, Heather will seek that out in the chat box. Yes. Um, you can write that in. Absolutely. Nice. We, and we do have some questions. And thank you so much, Angela. That was some great information. And it's funny that you bring up Daniel, uh, Daniel LaCroix because he, or Darren LaCroix, because he is actually going to be one of the keynote speakers at our District 53 conference this Saturday. So if you have not yet registered, oh, wow. come on over. You, there's still room for some walk-ins. So. <laughs> yeah, that's such a treat. Everyone yes. should go to that. He's an amazing speaker. He he is. He's doing a special workshop on Sunday too, as well, which I signed up for. I'm very excited about it. So oh, is that only for Toastmasters? <laughs> um, no, actually, anybody can go. I think there's still some room left for it. Um, it's on the oh. District 53 website if you're looking for some information. So okay. Okay. So uh, we have two, some questions. So keynote pricing. Um, there was a question I was asked to do one last year but had no idea what to quote. And this was for a real estate association. Okay. Was it a local regional conference? Was it a national conference? Um, you know what? And I don't do know. You know how... I will ask them. 
<laughs> yeah, ask also yeah. how many people were going to be in attendance because all okay. that matters. Okay. Um, there was a, so, a comment. I'll, I'll, I, I just typed that in, so we're waiting for them to get back to us. Um, there was a comment, love the idea of a speaker plan. Uh, let's see. How do you feel about outsourcing your newsletter? I just don't have enough time in the day to do one, although I'd love to. I think it's really important for your fans and followers to hear your voice in your writing. And when you outsource, when you outsource something, that gets lost. Mm -hmm. So if you're known for being funny or relatable or, you know, authentic in some way, it's really hard to outsource the newsletter because it usually, you know, corresponds with that same type of brand that you bring out on stage. So if you're looking at creating a newsletter that's simply a list of updates, like here's where I'm speaking and you can sign up for my blog and follow me on social media, then yeah, you can outsource that. But if you're looking to create something more personable that's maybe informative and give some good content on speaking or whatever your topic is, I would say you should write that yourself. And it's totally fine to have an assistant or hire someone to do the behind the scenes work of actually getting it out to your fans. But I think it's really important to have your own personal touch as well. Okay. And to get back to the earlier comment, she said it was a regional conference, about 300 people attending. Okay. Well, I guess the other question I have is what's the ticket price? But she can, let's say the ticket price is $150. If there, we'll go with 100 because I'm not great at math. So let's say there's $100 per ticket and there's 300 people there. That's a huge budget to be working with for the event. And if it's one day long and there's one or two keynotes, you can guess that there's probably $10,000 set aside for the, the main speaker. And I think that's a fair number to request. But it also comes down to your own brand. If you're not very well known in the, in the field and you don't have much background yet, then it's harder to ask for a high number. But if you've written a book and you've been featured in major, major media outlets and you have a number of testimonials and you're, you're well known as a speaker, $10,000 is totally fine to ask for. If you're brand new, I'd probably bring it down to like 5,000 or 7,500 just because they're taking a chance on you because you're not a superstar yet, but it's, it's fine to ask for money. And you can also just go with what's your budget. <laughs> Another great way to be a detective when you're trying to create, understand fees is to look at who they hired in the past. And you can Google like num name of the real estate conference 2015 because they have an old website or an old web page they haven't taken down yet. And if it shows who the keynote speaker is, you can Google that person. And sometimes the keynote speaker is a member of a speaker bureau. And if you go to that speaker's bureau website, you can look at the, that speaker's profile page, and sometimes it will show you their pay range. And I've done that before and found, wow, okay, the person who spoke as the keynote last year may charges between fifteen and twenty-five thousand dollars. So now I kind of know the range that this company is working with if they're able to hire her. So you kind of get some more background information before you start putting your quote together. Okay. Um, and we had just actually had another question come in too. Um, a couple of them. Um, do you price by topic, I guess that and by size of group and do you offer discounts for nonprofits? Wait, what was the first part of the question? Um, do you price by topic or by size of group? There are, it's, it's hard to just give like a black and white answer to that question because it really depends on, yes, the number of people in attendance, but also have you done this speech before? If someone's asking you to deliver a speech you've never done before, well now you've got a whole lot of time you have to commit to creating that presentation. So that's going to cost more money. Um, if there's 50 people in the audience, yes, that's different than 500 people. And if they're going to record your presentation and use it again later, yes, that's going to be different. So there are a lot of different things to take into account. And if it's a nonprofit, I, I always give a discount. Typically, they don't even really have a budget. So it's something that you do because you care about the cause. It's also great to be um, attached to their brand and they might have great connections to more people who could hire you to speak. 
So I usually charge about half price for a nonprofit, or I don't charge at all. Okay. Uh, let's see. How do you use social media to recruit speaking gigs? I don't actively recruit speaking gigs with social media, but I use social media to stay top of mind with the people in my network. So I'll always post when I'm doing a speaking gig and what I'm talking about. So when people are going through their news feed and they see, oh, Angela is speaking about how to become a public speaker on June 5th in Springfield, Mass., good to know, and they file that away. And the more times they see that, the more I'm building a brand in their mind as a speaker on the topic, topic of public speaking. And I've gotten a lot of inquiries from people who say, hey, I'm in your LinkedIn network, and I see that you're posting that you are giving speeches all over the place about public speaking. Can you come give a, a talk on that topic to us? So it's more of... Um, it's an opportunity to stay in front of people about what I'm doing, but I don't reach out to them on social media. Okay. And do you recommend putting your pricing publicly? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you, I've seen people do this who've been speaking for a long time. And if you've been, you're established and you have, your rates are set and it doesn't matter, there's no room for negotiation, you've built your brand and you're in demand, then yes, put your, your quote and your fees on your website. But when you're starting out, everything is so flexible and it really all depends on each individual opportunity that by putting your fees on your website, you're kind of pigeonholing, pigeonholing yourself. You know, you're, you're putting yourself in a box that'll be hard to get out of. Especially if you say, I don't do any speaking gigs for less than $500. And then Google calls and says, well, we want to have you speak for free, but we'll pay for your travel. Well, now what do you do? Because your website is different from what they're asking you to do. So I say just leave it off and make each opportunity unique and weigh the pros and cons of each and then create your fee based on that, that okay. whole process. Okay. And then uh, the last question that, that's come in is, do you charge for travel time? I hear mixed things from people that speak for profit. Charge for travel time. I don't charge for travel time. I, tra I charge, I get reimbursed for travel. So if I get a hotel room, if I fly somewhere, if I get um, a cab or if I rent a car, I keep all of my receipts and then I get it reimbursed. So that's the way that I do it. If I'm traveling by car, I'll get reimbursed for mileage, but I don't charge for the time that, I, that it takes to get somewhere. And I think every speaker has a different way of doing this, and that's just the way that I'm most comfortable. I only charge for the actual speech and, you know, if there's time for creating it and if I'm going to be giving something away. Like a couple months ago, I created a whole workbook, so I charged for the time to create the workbook, and then I charged for the actual workbook. Okay, terrific. And that looks like it's it for questions right now. If you have questions that occur to you after the fact, Angela has her contact information and her website up there. Uh, you can also email me uh, it went with the registration information. I would be happy to pass along any further questions to her. Thank you so much, Angela, for this great information and for taking the time out to present tonight. And I You're hope welcome. you have a great evening. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Okay. And thank you, everyone, and have a terrific evening.